Hello, it's Bob Pandolfo on Sunday, October 27th with Power Brush by Pandy. And this uh, is about the Breeders' Crown, which was raced Friday and Saturday, October 25th and 26th, 2024, at the Meadowlands. And they set a new uh, record for both nights in handle. Uh, General Manager Jason Seenamore uh, noted that today. So that's great. Weather was perfect. Track was in good condition. Not too speed favoring, which is good. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that later. So let's just go to Friday, and we started out with Lady Landia winning the two-year-old Philly Trot. So five seven one. So twelve to one odds. Now this in this race, I had Lady Landia four four to one. Um, Swanstead, you know, is is a master at getting these horses ready for these big races, and, and she had been steadily improving. And that's always, you know, a good sign, especially in a barn like his. Now, what happened in this race, though, I mean, first of all, 12 to 1 odds were really good for this for this filly. But what happened in this race is, I, you know, Luna Lovegood, I thought, was a legitimate favorite in this race. This is a really fast trotter, Luna Lo uh, Lovegood. But what happened was Dexter Dunn floated out, and for some reason, you know, she broke on the first turn. You know, these are two-year-old fillies, trotters, and she had a lot of trot in this race. You know, he, 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 there was nothing he could do after that. I mean, he was, you know, 10th, as you can see, 13 lanes behind. So he started coming up the inside, and then he was, you know, he was in traffic. She had a lot of trot finishing. This is a very fast filly, so I think, that, I think she has a bright future. But Lady Landia was a nice overlay in that spot. James McDonald, I mean, maybe they didn't bet the horse because of James McDonald. Um, James McDonald, you know, I guess he's, you know, he's not a household name here, but I mean, he's the number one driver in Canada. It has been, I believe for four straight years and he's a great driver. I mean, he's, you know, he's as good as any of these drivers. I mean, you know, so if I see James McDonald coming on the horse that I'm looking to bet, I'm feeling good about it. Then we had the two year old Phillies here, Mickey and Minnie. This is a really nice drive by Dunn. Um, in this race, I thought it was a two-horse race, basically, between um, Mickey and Minnie, and, and the favorite looks good in Lulu. So I made Mickey and, and Minnie five to one odds, uh, five to two odds, and went off at you know, almost six to one, I guess, because of post nine. But, they, I mean, these were clearly, on paper, I thought, the two fastest fillies. And very nice try. He got the top. Then he went first though, right? You know, Dexter Dunn had a huge night, six, uh, a, new, a huge um, Breeders' Crown, six winners. I believe it was six, right? Yeah. And uh, so uh, this is really nice filly. Looks Lulu, uh, looks good in Lulu. Um, you know, could bounce back out of this. She didn't race badly at all. You got to remember, you know, you're, you're getting, uh, you know, in this time of year, it's not that hot at night. So it was 56 degrees here. Um, I, I think, was that a post time? Let's see. Yeah, that was at post time. So by the time this race went off, it was probably even um, cooler than that. And that makes it tougher to, to last on the front end, you know, which makes the races better, quite frankly. If you race the same races on a warm, you know, July night or August night, um, you could have different results because the speed carries better. So it's better that the track is tiring, you know, to be honest with you, because you just get a, you know, a more exciting you get more exciting races. You can't steal races on the front end that easily. Then in the next race, uh, uh, Marilyn, who was my best bet, I made her seven to five. She had won um, three stakes, major stakes races in a row. No big surprise there. Um, Dexter Dunn got her to leave with a first over move. And then you had the Breeders' Crown, two-year-old Colts and Gelding, this this was a really cool race. Um, I picked Lou Prince second. Let me see. Um, yeah, I picked Swingtown, and then I picked Lou Prince. I made them both nine to two. Um, I thought this was a very competitive race, and so Swingtown, you know, had a decent cover trip, but there wasn't much pace in, in the race. You know, what's going to happen, too, is, you know, with the cooler temperatures, the drivers aren't going to be quite as aggressive as they might be on a hot night because they don't want to burn their horses out. So, you, you know, you'll get some races with a little bit of a tepid pace. Not really tepid, but not quite as hot as you might get, you know, during the uh, summer nights when the drivers are afraid that, you know, somebody, you know they're going to let a, a horse steal it on the front end. 
So this race, you know, the, the only reason why I really put Swingtown ahead of Luprint, I thought they were both, you know, evenly matched. I, like I said, I made Luprint 7-2, to 8-1. to one. That's how you can use my line, you know. My line, I'm, I'm telling you what I think the horse, you know, what his chances are, basically. His or hers chances, in this case, it's two-year-old fillies. I mean, no, this is two-year-old colts, I'm sorry. But I'm, I'm telling you what, you know, the, the horse's chances are. If I make a horse 7-2, to two, I think the horse has... You know, obviously, a, you know, pretty good chance of winning, and so eight to one is a good value. So, Ronnie Wren Jr. This is, I believe, his first Breeders' Crown win, and you know, this is a filly. Uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, a colt who hadn't been leaving, but it's a two-year-old, so hasn't really raced that often. I kind of figured he'd leave. You know, if you don't leave from post nine, and you have a horse like this that is a main contender. And in my opinion, this horse was probably about second ranked in this race. Uh, and, and if he had, let's put it this way, if Luprint had two, post two and Swingtown had post nine, I would have picked Luprint. You know, I just mainly picked Swingtown because of the edge and post positions. But um, I f kind of figured Ronnie Wren Jr. would probably leave, even though the horse hadn't been leaving. The thing is, with these great drivers, you know, a driver like Ronnie Wren Jr., I mean, he's going to be able to leave. If he wants to leave, he's going to leave. You know, he doesn't need a speed horse. You know, drivers like this, they, if they want to get the horse out of the gate, they're going to get the horse out of the gate. And he got the horse out of the gate absolutely perfectly. You know, he, he used he used the horse just hard enough where he was able not only be able to get to Lee without using him too hard, but he also, you know, didn't have to, like, gun to the lead and then give it up and end up third and shuffled. You know, he, he ended up sitting second behind Fallout, who is a good horse to follow because Fallout's a real nice colt, too. And then he came out in the stretch, and he had to work. He had to work this horse, you know, really hustle this horse to get up. But um, you know, very, very nice uh, effort by Blueprint. I thought it was a very good drive by Wren. And like, I'm a big fan of Wren. You know, what happens with these drivers is the drivers that drive at the Meadowlands tend to get the drives on all these top horses. But fortunately for Wren, he's been driving um, at the Meadows. He drives at you know the Meadows in Pennsylvania and Northfield in Ohio. And Ron Burke, you know, gave him some horses to drive, and he picked up the drive on Luprint. And, you know, he's a great, like I say, he's a great driver. I'll put Ren up with any of these drivers. Um, you know, very good hands, gets a lot of speed out of horse, smart driver. So that was another, uh, you know, horse that was pretty nice overlay there. And so that was it for Friday's card. So now Saturday's card... I had a really good night Saturday. I had eight winners on top Saturday. And so we're going to start out with uh, the fourth race, Call Me Goo. I made, I, I thought Call Me Goo was just as good as MN's Dream. Now, MN's Dream, I know people would say, well, you know, she's the class of the field. But Call Me Goo had really been coming on. And she had been um, transferred to the Swanstead Barn. And... She had shown improvement. She'd only raced a few times for Swanstead. She'd shown improvement. Uh, like I say here in my in my picks, um, call me go call me go race well in both starts since the barn changed to Swanstead, and she could be sitting on a big effort tonight. So I figured, hey, I'm going to make her co-favorite with this, you know, with the top class MN's dream. As it turned out, it was a very good drive by Swanstead because he, he he worked her to the lead. He didn't use her hard at all. This was another race where they really weren't gunning too hard. So you had horses leaving, but they weren't pushing, you know, had their, they didn't have their foot down to the metal, you know, full flash. Again, it's not a hot night. Um, but he managed to get her to the lead past the quarter, and MN's Dream, you know, um, got parked out. And there was no reason to give it up to MN's Dream. You know, the, the, after you go 27 and 4 to the quarter, Swanstead made the right move. He held the lead, and she was just very good. And, and you know, Swanstead is just very, very good in these races. It's funny; some people knock him as a driver, but yeah, I, I would uh, if I owned a top class horse and it was like a seven hundred thousand dollar race. Um, what was the person? This one. This one was four hundred ninety six thousand dollars. I would take Swanstead to drive my horse any day of the of the week, um, and twice on Sundays if it was uh, especially a trot race. I mean, this guy's like uh, won a lot of races uh, for big money. So uh, now we have um, the three-year-old filly race. So this was a, a you know a very good you know 
look, I, I actually put listed five horses, which I normally don't do, but it was so wide open. I put Allegiant second, draw an impression, I put first. Um, they both, uh, you know, race pretty well. Draw an impression, you know, uh, get, uh, Roy gave him good, a good uh, drive, uh, uh, gave her a good drive, but there wasn't, you know, a fast enough pace, and, uh, you know, she just couldn't get there. Allegiant, really nice drive by Scotty Z. R. Molina raced really well here on the front end from post eight. Then you go to the three-year-old Philly Pacers. Um, I picked my girl, EJ. Dexter Dunn, you know, worked her to the lead at the half. The pace wasn't that fast. You can see in a lot of these races, the last half is faster. You see, uh, 54-2, and two, last half, first half, only 55-1. and one. Again, uh, you know, drivers not trying to overextend their horses with the temperatures being lower. You know, this is the sixth race. It's, it was 54 degrees to start. It's probably a little cool over that time. One thing in this race I thought was a mistake was that they didn't leave with Rocket Dio. Racing, racing Rock and D, Rocket Dio off the pace here didn't make any sense. Uh, the horse has a lot of speed and probably would have gotten a, de you know, a decent trip. Uh, I thought that was, I don't know why they raced Rocket Dio off the pace that time. Didn't make any sense. Now, here's an interesting race. Now, here I picked Six Hour. I have felt that Six Hour was the top three-year-old in the country, you know, for a while now. Um, here you can see I picked the, that race to win. And then Six Hour, I had eight winners on top on Saturday. Six Hour, I made six to five. Now, I liked him in the handball, and I think he probably would have won that race, but he got blocked. If he didn't win the race, he would have finished second in like a very, you know, by like, in a photo finish with the uh, the horse that, that won that race. Um, but uh, I thought Six Hour, it, you know, is as good as any three-year-old in the country. Um, and he went on and he won the BL, he won the Kentucky Futurity, Futurity and then last start, he, you know, he looked like he was going to break in the eliminations, but they had the shoes on last week. And this is the thing, and I don't like this whole thing with the shoes. You know, they take the shoes off, a lot of these trotters go a lot faster, you have to be at the track, basically, to even find out if, if the horses, you know, are taking shoes off. They announced it at the track. It's not in the program. In my opinion, either they should just not allow horses to take shoes off at all, or it should be in the program the day before, like the thoroughbreds, blinkers on, blinkers off. The reason why they do that is because some horses are in thoroughbreds. When you put blinkers on, they're like a completely different horse. There have literally been like hundreds of horses that, were ordinary horses, and then they put blinkers on and became stakes winners. There have been thousands of horses that put blinkers on and, you know, went from a horse that was struggling to break its maiden to become a, you know, pretty nice racehorse. So blinkers on is a big thing, and blink and shoes off with trotters is, is similar. It's, you know, in fact, I would say it's even more reliable than blinkers, blinkers on. You know, some horses blink, you put blinkers on them and does absolutely nothing. With these shoes off, a lot of these trotters go faster, and it should be in the program. I mean, this is just kind of ridiculous, really. And this is the, the reason why, you know, you got good odds, though. Six hours, six to five. As you can see, I said he'll reportedly take shoes off tonight, and I expect a big effort. Um, six hour, as you can, um, if I get down to the chart here, as you can see, paid nine to two, uh, um, seven to two odds, 9.20, paid $9.20. TCI, you know, put in a good effort and, um, but six hour, uh, perfect drive by McCarthy. Um, didn't have a tremendous amount of pace in front of him, but had enough and, you know, he, he got up a very nice effort. This race, the Breeders' Count open pace was a really wide race. I picked the obvious horse by the missile who, um, went off at two to five and raced well, but it was a blazing pace. This was a race where it looked like a summertime, you know, warm night, you know, the horses, a bucket Hanover. I, I didn't, I didn't really know for sure would leave. I thought it would probably race off the pace here. I thought it's my show would take back. Uh, I thought that was a potential, you know, long shot underneath, maybe even as an upsetter if the pace got fast. But as it turned out, the horse that benefited the most was Coach Stefano's who was far back, and you have to give the horse credit, though, I mean, I mean, fast pace or not, the horse was flying, 25 and 3, last quarter, you know, came from, you know, dead last, just blew by them all, great drive by McDonald, made, you know, timed his move perfectly, 
So that was the big upset on the night and a very exciting race. It, it, it figured to be an exciting race. I mean, these are, you know, the fastest horses, uh, older horses in uh, harness racing. Winner's bet, I picked Periculum, um, who I thought had a good chance to upset from off the pace. And Scotty Z, you know, gave the horse a perfect drive, but Winner's bet just held on. Uh, Periculum probably would have had him in the next step. So I thought that was, a, you know, pretty exciting race also. Moran Chanover, I picked this horse too. Um, here's Periculum, here's Moran Chanover. Now, Moran Chanover, I only thought Captain O'Bonnell had a slight edge over Moran Chanover. So I thought I thought the odds were off in this race too. I picked Moran Chanover 2-1. to one. I made Captain O'Bonnell 7-5. to five. And... Um, As you can see, they, Mirage Hanover went off at five to two, and Captain Albano went off at sixty cents to a dollar. Nijinsky was a little higher than I thought he might be. You know, these three horses are, are pretty much like the same horse. Mirage Hanover, Nijinsky, I mean, they, they they've all won major you know races. Nijinsky was hotter earlier in the year, but he, with him, it was just a matter of if he can you know get a decent trip. Uh, he, he closes very well, but Mirage Channel got the perfect trip, pocket trip. This was an easy, once I saw that Mirage Channel was getting like a perfect trip, it looked like he'd probably get Captain Albano. Captain Albano had no excuse really, set a quick pace, but I mean, you know, he raced well, he didn't race outstanding. This is another race, if it was a hot, you know, summer night, probably would have finished second and probably, you know, maybe, maybe won or it would have been a much closer race, but, but uh, you know, by, by, by race 10, it was probably like, you know, 50 degrees or maybe a little cooler, and uh, that helps. So Dutchman Dunn, you know, gets another one there. Then you had the open mares. I picked I picked the Twin B Joe Fresh, but I mean, it was that was like an easy race to pick. I, uh, she, you know, she was just too fast for these horses. Um, and then you just had the ordinary races. Uh, I, I actually had the last three winners on top: Better Bundle, Sweet Amira, and um, Build the Wall. So it gave me eight winners on a night. But you know, the the Breeders' Crown races were were very good. Uh, you know, Meadowlands gets credit too because they when they have these big races, they, they they make sure the track's not speed favoring. And like I said, cooler you know temperatures later in the year helps too. Good handle, great driving by you know Dexter Dunn. Congratulations to all the winners. Congratulations to Ronnie Wren Jr. getting that big win. Congratulations, of course, to to all the trainers and owners. Very, very good racing, and uh, you know, I'm just glad to see that harness racing, you know, has these these exciting moments. You know, a lot of the regular races sometimes are disappointing because they're supposed to be favoring and everything, especially on the smaller tracks. But these stakes races usually, um, you know, give uh, you know, kind of give a flashback to the good old days when harness racing was, you know, a, a huge sport. Because when you have the best horses and the best drivers and all these great horsemen. And over a one-mile track, or any two-turn track, really, it's just very exciting. Now, next year, it's going to be in Mohawk, which is a 7-H track, which is which will be very good. And then I think the year after, in 2026, I think it's going to be at Hoosier, which is a 7-H track, which is also a good track to have these races. So anyway, hope you enjoyed the races. And um, I kind of redeemed myself in my picks, because my picks in the elimination races uh, last week were... Eh, not the greatest, but I don't bet those races. I mean, the elimin race, elimination races are terrible races to bet, and because the drivers don't really have to win those races, you know, so it's it's really, you know, it's just hard to bet those races. And now with the shoes off thing, you know, six hours, a classic example. I mean, if anybody bet him last week when he had the shoes on, they didn't really, you know, they didn't really want him to be his absolute best last week. They just wanted to get him in there. Then you take the shoes off this week and you give them that, you know, extra little, you know, spunk, that little spring in his step there, and he ends up being a nice overlay uh, last night, six hours. He's the top three-year-old, you know, in the country, in my opinion. Um, but anyway, uh, th thanks for tuning in. Uh, do me a favor and uh, subscribe to my, uh, my page, and uh, good luck.